back again. We are again in Revelation 17. Now we're focusing on the end of verse 8. This is where Anastasius died and Justin 1 comes to power. Justin 1, the, the accounts vary. Burry, the historian, one of the better known historians, J.B. Burry, says that Justin came to power here in 518 um, as a result of Anastasius' death, but it wasn't quite immediate. There was a sort of scuffle about who to appoint. He ends up getting appointed maybe because he bribed some soldiers. It was the typical thing from ancient Roman history, you know, where the soldiers make you king. It was going on in Constantinople, too. But some of the other biographies and stuff I've read of him say that he was 70 years old at this point, at the Blepon and Bleponton. But Burry says he was 66. So I'm going to go with Burry for this. He stays in power until 520 at the end of 526, which is the beginning of 527, because at the beginning of, in the early part of April, which is the beginning of the Hebrew sacred year, and that might be what John is using, he gets, he, he gets uncontrollably ill. Okay? He's really dying here, and uh, well, he's dying in August, but he gets really sick in April, which is the beginning of the Hebrew sacred year. And at that point, Justinian finally takes over the reigns, is appointed co-emperor. But there was, it's like Justinian didn't really, Justin didn't really want to have Justinian take over. There's sort of like an uncertainty. Okay, so it's not until the last four months of Justin's life that Justinian really starts to have emperor power. Okay, but at the same time, and again, it depends on who you talk to. This, the accounts of Justinian's reign are really um, polarized. That's the problem that we're going to have when talking about this. Um, it, a lot of the accounts maintain that Justin was sort of like a figurehead, and it was really Justinian who started the reigns. And again, we got a difference of the birth dates. Based on other writings that I looked at, Justinian at the point here at the Blepo of Bleponton, he would have been 36. But it looks like um, Burry is saying he was 40. Now I might have misremembered that. But the reason I'm saying that is because the reign of Justinian is 40 years. Well, just shy of 40 years. So when you ever you see a number like that in scripture you know you have David ruling for 40 years Saul had you ruled for 40 years before him Solomon you ruled for 40 years after him you have our boy um, Joseph ruling for two sets of 40 years with the the fat years and the lean years in the middle when you see numbers like that that's always supposed to tell you something and usually it's telling you something good but this isn't something good. Justinian is the poster boy for the Antichrist. And since the, the, the accounts of him are so polarized, that tells you something about how an Antichrist is going to be perceived. It's a very different idea of all the movies that you've seen about what the Antichrist is. We you know, most of our movies we portray the Antichrist as being charismatic. But almost all the movies that are about Bible are really bad. They're two-dimensional, they're syrupy, they, um, they're shallow, okay? So we have to, like, go through both sides. And what I'm trying to introduce here is that when a person is charismatic, people really like you or they really hate you. I was told that when I was 13 by my history teacher. I didn't know what charisma was. He told me I had it. I'm not so sure I do. But he thought so. When I was 13 anyway. 
And that's when I learned what the word meant. Well, that's what this guy had to be. He had to be charismatic. And the Antichrist has to be charismatic. But one of the things that charisma does is it produces very strong reactions, either positive or negative. So the accounts that we have of Justinian's reign are drooling, even by one of his arch critics, a guy named Procopius, are either drooling or, or, or vitriolic. And Procopius does both. Procopius is the primary historian of this period, him and Theophanes. But Procopius actually lived during these years and was an adjutant to Belisarius, who was the main general that Justinian used. And you have Procopius writing a reasonably dry, not uninteresting history of the wars that, that he accompanied Belisarius on. And he was trying to be a little Herodotus there. And then during that time, sometime before he wrote his last book, which is called The Buildings, which is just drooling panegyric in favor of Justinian. In the middle, and I and Burry didn't know why, but I think I do, in the middle he writes this so-called secret history of Justinian and Theodora, which is just scathing. And so Burry, like pretty much any normal Roman historian, gets real skeptical of that secret history book because it's so nasty, all right? But when you start to match up the timeline, and that's where we're going to have, we're going to be spending a lot of time on Justinian because of the timeline. When you start matching up the timeline, that middle book, the secret history, which is so scathing and basically treats um, our boy Justinian like he's the devil incarnate, that book is basically written after Belisarius, who um, Procopius really liked, after Belisarius started to be treated badly by Justinian. So it, it, in the middle, Belisarius, who really saved Rome in many ways, all these major campaigns you're going to start hearing about when I cover this, um, Belisarius was basically in charge of them. He would basically send Belisarius to the Africa, then he'd send him to Italy, then he'd send him to Persia, and back and forth, and sometimes up to the Balkans. And, you know, Belisarius was his go-to general. And f for no good reason, Justinian gets jealous and basically, um, what do you want to call it, sacks Belisarius from all of his wealth and Theodora has a hand in it supposedly and she gives the money to Belisarius' wife who's always cheating on him and and so Belisarius is disgraced so much so that it remained a sort of myth about Belisarius that he was reduced to being a beggar in the streets which wasn't true but he was disgraced toward the end of, of his time being of service to Justinian. So you've got droolers, because it's not just Procopius, but primarily him. you got droolers, and you got people who absolutely hated him. Okay? The Bible is looking at this, however, from a very different perspective. So it's, what I'm going to try to do is weave the history with the biblical perspective. We saw the biblical perspective before we even got to Justin. The people will be paying attention to the beast because it was, meaning they want to go back. And as soon as Justinian comes to power, and maybe even somehow with Justin's blessing, they, they state their purpose is to regain the glory of Rome that was, see, here's the word was in Greek, under Constantine. Well, that's what this anaphoric center is all about. The aftermath of Constantine to what's going to end up being um, almost the end, well, just the, actually in the middle of Justinian. And then verse 9, of course, the verse numbers didn't exist in the original Bible. 
So you might want to like just continue this as considering it as part of verse 8 if you like. But if we do that, then we end it here at, at where John was benchmarking to the 560 plus treating it as if, well, I'm writing at the beginning of the year, I'm writing seven years to the new millennium, and it's 560 years after that. So he's reconciling to the old pre-church schedule. This is when Justinian dies at the end of 565. Okay, so this seven kings and seven kings, he's dying before that, so this seven kings is not referring to him. It is referring to the aftermath of him, because that's basically what happens. But I, I'm getting ahead of myself. What I want to focus on is the big thing that, the big point that God is making here is that they want to revive Rome, which is explicitly what Justinian said he wanted to do, at least at the time of his accession and possibly before as, you know, a mouthpiece for Justin. Okay, which is right here is when he acceded and, and when Justin actually dies. Okay, so you have to, it, it, it's a very long reign. It's almost 40 years. So it's like an antichrist 40 years. And as you might have seen from the end of episode 9, is that the Muslims are expecting Christ to come back too. They're also expecting him to live for 40 years too. They're expecting him to come and be reborn or just appear. Because they actually teach that he never actually died. He just went to heaven. Kind of like Enoch. And then he just magically comes back. But it's going to take 40 years once he comes back in order for him to show himself. And then you have their equivalent of the tribulation. But the accounts differ as to whether it's 6 years or 7 years or 13 years. Okay, so this idea of someone coming back of a, of a end of time, of a renewal, is happening right now as I talk amongst Muslims, Russian Christians, because they're, they're trying to do the same thing that Justinian was doing, and amongst the Seven Mountains Christians. And here's where we're going to find out about the Seven Mountains. And the Seven Heads are, are Seven Mountains. That's the word for mountain, Hori. Okay, and that's a direct reference to Rome, but which Rome? Not the Rome in Italy. Okay, it's the Rome where Justinian is, because New Rome was rebuilt, replete with its own seven hills that were supposed to be modeled after the Rome in Italy, but that's the new power seat. Now, and I'm still not getting into the annual history because there's so much to cover. I'm trying to just do a sort of outline. What makes Justinian the poster boy for the Antichrist is that he's trying to revive Rome. So the poster boys today for the Antichrist are the people who are calling themselves Seven Mountains behind Trump. Just go on YouTube, type in Seven Mountains, and then some of their chief spokespersons are Raphael Cruz, Lance Wallnau, James Dobson, um, you know, any of those big names that are on TBN, okay? Any of the big names in Christianity, Jerry Falwell, Jr. now, okay? They all subscribe to the idea that there are seven mountains needed in order if Christianity takes over the seven mountains of political and economic power, then Christ has to come back. And 2030, of course, is the next 1,000, as I hope you saw me cover in Episode 9. Okay, so this is relevant even though we're talking about a guy who lived from 520, who ruled from 527 to 565 AD. The pattern of him, the pattern of him is being depicted as the pattern of the Antichrist. So we got to pay a lot of attention to what was life like for him, and it wasn't good. I mean, if, if you want to know that crime doesn't pay, if you want to know that being a ruler of, a, of an empire is, is not fun, he, this is your guy to look at. 
And that would be really important because, you know, the Bible isn't just for warning believers. The Bible's for warning everybody. And anybody who would have understood what this meter was could have read this the way I'm telling you and been forewarned. Like, you know, there's going to be an Antichrist Gentile. It's going to happen. And in history, this is an attempted trend, you know, often happening even right now. So anybody could read this, and if they knew it was Justinian as the model of the Antichrist, they'd go, oh, wow, I don't think I want all this power. I don't want to be a politicizing Christian. Yeah, you better not, because this guy had no good life at all. Period. So if you want to be, if you want to have power over the world, well, follow this guy and see what happened to him, and bet that the same will happen to you if you try. That's the point of this story. God always is trying to warn. God always is trying to protect you from yourself and from the world, you know, hurting you. And that's really what the story is. It's kind of empathetic. It's kind of sympathetic. At the same time, yes, he's the model of the Antichrist. But the model of the Antichrist is not this, not like the devil with two horns and a tail. All right? It's somebody who really believes in what he's doing. The Seven Mountains people behind Trump really believe in their false doctrine. They really think that if they take over the United States and make it a Christian nation, unite church and state, that's what Justinian did, if they do that, Christ will come back and it's holy for them to do that. And the Bible here is saying the exact opposite. And these people can't read it because look, and the seven heads are seven mountains. They look at that and they say, oh, okay, there are seven mountains we need to, to make uh, the U.S. a Christian nation, and we got to take over the White House, and we got to take over business, and we got to take over this, and we got to take over that. And they'll tell you on YouTube, Lance Wallnow, Rafael Cruz, go through the seven, what the seven mountains are. And I don't even remember what they are, I don't even care. But see, highlighted in black, they think that's holy. And anybody who has half a brain, reading Revelation 17, knows, no, this is not holy. This is the bad thing. The woman is riding the beast. Beast always signifies a political entity. The woman signifies religion. That's why she's clad in uh, scarlet. Religion is the, scarlet is the color of religion, even in the ancient world, and still today in, in Italy's Rome. And purple is, was the color of, of political rule. Okay? That's why I put all this in egregious purple. All right? So Justinian, he's, it's like the Antichrist himself is the most fooled. Okay? And there's all kinds of, like, gossip about this guy, not just in Procopius. Like, he comes to power, you know, through his uncle, and it's basically at the tall. See, this is 18, 19, 20, 21. He becomes a, um, I forget, a consul or something at this point. Really young for that role. Because that was like the highest honor after that. You went overseas and you ruled a, another country. Okay. Allegedly, he murdered the guy who was the consul in order to get the job. Well, did he really do that or not? Who knows? But obviously people were reacting to him that strongly. Okay? So he's looking at the beast because it was, and they want to revive it. That ends Justin's time. Now we come into Justinian's time. And again, Kaiser is truncated deftly to Kai. He's just a connective mark in history and is not. Well, that characterizes Justinian. Okay, but at the same time, the beast they want to revive is not. And what's so, I, how do I want to put this? What's so poignant about this is during these years from 527 
to the end of 530 because that's where the clause ends because the angel's being really dramatic here. Justinian is all full of vim and vigor in his first three years. Oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I'm going to do that. Oh, I'm going to make this. Oh, we're going to revive Rome. And he's all full of that sort of a new ruler. Oh, I'm going to fix things. Oh, I'm going to do things. Oh, I'm going to honor Christ. And he starts out, besides, you know, getting rid of Justin's advisors that he didn't like and all that kind of stuff. He marries Theodora. All that stuff goes on. Well, actually, he married Theodora sometime in here. But when he accedes to power, he's doing a lot of cleanup of the old administration. And he's, like, much more, um, what do you want to call it, uh, fanatical about asserting the Council of Chalcedon. So there are a lot of monophysites. About half of the empire were monophysites, especially in Palestine and the Middle East, which is where most of their money came from. And he, he goes in a big way for the Council of Chalcedon. All right, well, basically, the Council of Chalcedon said, if you don't agree with our definition of God, then you're a heretic and you die, or we confiscate your property, or we exile you and confiscate your property, or kill you and confiscate your property, always confiscate your property. So he was he was busy doing that in these first, three year, first four years, and he's having a lot of success at it, a lot. And he hires people to collect money for him, and they're sort of unscrupulous, and maybe he knew about it, maybe he didn't, but he's suddenly getting lots and lots of money during this time. And the people are getting squeezed. All right? So when you come down to the next Kai, which is 531 A.D., the squeezing is getting to be way too much. And at this first part, pareste, this is the word for and will come. It's, it's, it, 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 it has other meanings besides come, but I'm right now just being simple. That's the Nika revolt in 532. Now, what base, this took place over more than just 532. It's really going on. You have to leave this word out. Pollen doesn't belong. It was a later edition. So it's, it's Kai Par. Okay. That sounds like another word in Greek that I'm not going to cover because that's just another word play. But basically during that time outline in black, Constantinople at this point has had it with all the taxes and all the oppression, and they're sick of the, the persecution of the Monophysites, because while Constantinople personally, and within its own borders, was pro-Council of Chalcedon, most of the people around it were not. And so you had all kinds of riots and all kinds of problems, and there were these two teams in the Hippodrome that raced horses. They were the Blues and the Greens, and the Blues were pro-Council of Chalcedon and were favored by Justinian. But the Greens were favored by Justinian's wife. And they were monophysite. That tells you what kind of division there was. And during this time, and even a little prior to it, starting right up here, they, they started getting all full of themselves because they either had her patronage as monophysites or they had his patronage as Council of Chalcedon, so they brought their own war against each other to the streets. And there was just a whole lot of unrest going on in Constantinople itself, and it spilled outside the walled city. Constantinople was a very large walled city. It spilled outside it, and everybody and his brother was taking sides. Are you for the Council of Chalcedon up here or against it? If you were against it, then you were supposed to be on Theodora's side. If you were for it, you were supposed to be on Justinian's side. And there's some question as to whether or not the wife took one position and Justinian took the other position so they could be good cop, bad cop. But in all events, what happens is that your property gets confiscated. And they started making a heck of a lot of money from this. 
Now, how much of that was at their instigation and how much of that those they just passively accepted? Well, that's an argument you can make. Problem is, it happened. And it reaches a fever pitch right here at par. That's the Nika Revolt. Most of the major buildings in Constantinople proper were burnt to the ground. Lots of people were killed. Lots of people were killed. And it was so bad that Justinian was felt like, well, maybe we need to leave in the middle of the night. And there's this famous anecdote that where his wife gives a speech that she, you know, she'd rather die a queen than live peacefully and even wealthily um, as a common person. So because of that speech, everybody was so enthused. They go back and they fight the Nika revolt. Well, what happens is Belisarius rises as a result of this. This is how. Um, Justinian finds uh, Belisarius. He helps Justinian put down like 30,000 of them get killed. They, they herd him into the Hippodrome and then they kill him. Real brutal. Real brutal put down. And after that it's like, well see, I'm Justinian. I win against all of you. And then everybody starts to be quiet after that. Yeah. You're using your force like that? Okay, so a lot of the crime died because of it, because the blues and the greens were doing a lot of crime and murder and mayhem. But on the other hand, it's put down by force. So Justinian, his sort of like innocence, maybe if there was a period of innocence, started there, but it's gone by here. And it's like, oh, okay, force wins. I just, if I'm nasty, I win. Kind of like Donald Trump. He always plays the nasty boy. He's always practicing brinkmanship. Well, that's what Justinian learns at this point. Okay? But that's not all. Because at the same time this is going on, that was 532. At the same time this is going on, you've got his avowed purpose, starting back here at 527, of you know, making the glory of Rome. Okay, so that leads to a kind of timeline with respect to what else he did. Okay, that, yeah, this is 521, it was consul. It's a question of whether he murdered the current consul in order to inherit that job. Okay, from Justin I. Okay, he married Theodore in 525. So that was, that was right here. Or you could say at the end of Hoti. Okay. Now we got the Nika riots, which I just covered. All right. And then, yeah, okay, this is where he discovers Belisarius. Belisarius then becomes his general, and the first war he wages is with the Vandals. Okay. And that's in Africa. And it worked. Okay. It took like until 534, which is where John is stopping. See, this is 534. Notice how carefully John is tracking this by means of the clauses. Okay, when I broke this in the clauses, I had no idea this is what was going to result. I'm really shocked about it. Because a lot of people really like Justinian, and I'm sure they're going to be mad if they see this video. So the end of 534 is marking his victory. See, Nika means victory, conquer. He conquered Africa at the end of that and he conquered the blues and the greens by then so he's thinking to himself oh I won in Africa and and Rome is being rebuilt and Africa was a breadbasket always was a breadbasket to Rome so he's thinking oh wow we're, we're the I'm reviving the beast that that was and he's thinking real high of himself right here. Okay. Real high of himself. Because he's having all this victory under Belisarius. And that's who Procopius was accompanying Belisarius. So that's Africa. Finishes in 534. Okay. And then right hard on it, but it's on again and off again. 
And this timeline leaves out a lot of important data. But we'll just go with it. He goes to war with the Goths. Now that's in the West, but it's not all of the West, it's just Italy. Because one of the things about the Council of Chalcedon that Justinian newly supports is this was upheld by the Pope in Italy. So he's thinking, okay, I'm going to reconquer and make Western Rome again, and I'm going to reconquer Italy from the Goths. Okay, and that's happening starting in 535. Okay, Hode, here. Okay, and it really, it's a sort of idiom. He's look here. All right. And the, the angel's getting ready to say something that is so, uh, oh, so shockingly biting that I don't know if I can cover it. But the point for you, I'm going to close this for the moment because I'm getting shocked again, um, that this is where the Gothic campaign started. But it's on again, off again for the next 20 years. All right, right here. To reconquer Italy from the Goths. It's not just the Goths, it's the Lombards and a bunch of other people that aligned with the Goths during this time. But he starts it right there. So that's Hode. Okay? Hode. And Mark uses this to mock Byzantium also, which we'll cover in later videos. Hode. Look here. Pay attention. And all Justinian is paying attention to is how great he is that he has reconquered Africa and he's so wealthy now because of his unscrupulous advisors and because he's he's um, confiscating the property of everybody who's a monophysite. Well his wife is confiscating the property of everybody who supports Council of Chalcedon. So they're both getting really rich on purpose or just by passive acceptance which is worse. So he's not paying attention. He's not looking here. He's looking at himself. He's looking at his conquering. And I'm going to pick that up in the next thing.